Hello, welcome. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, this is the week 10 webinar for the stats class. And um, today is, um, it's an important day in terms of real usefulness. Um, what we're doing today is used in a lot of different circumstances. So um, as always, I'll start out with any questions you might have. So, you know, feel free to pop in the chat box or call it out and I'll answer your questions. And then what we're going to do is we're going to talk about regression analysis. Um, so basically what that's all about is you have two things that are both quantitative. And in those quantitative things, um, you can you want to compare them and you say, well, if one goes up, does the other go up? Does the other go down? What goes on? Just one second. Um, let me talk and then uh, Yeah, a little less sound. Okay, um, so if one goes up, the other goes up or down, or maybe if one goes up, you don't know anything about the other one. Um, so we're going to be looking at that stuff. And one thing that because you have two quantitative variables that are paired up, then we can look at scatter plots. So you can basically graph the dots for all of them. Then we're going to talk about the correlation. So the letter we use for correlation is R. So we're going to talk about, you know, what does it mean for two things to be correlated? And uh, that's used a lot in the real world. So we'll get into that. Then we'll talk about R squared. Um, I know it's just the square of R, but it actually has some a very deep meaning. And we'll kind of go over that. Then when you have a scatter plot, if there seems to be like a, a pattern where one goes up, the other goes up, you can draw a line and you can say, you know, what's the best fitting line for that data? And that best fitting line is called the regression line. And we're going to be looking at the equation of a regression line. And in particular, um, got to remember some stuff about lines like slope and y-intercept. And we'll talk about those things. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to mention a, a big error a lot of people make, not just students, but literally professionals, is they say there's a correlation, we have a regression line. So if one happens, then we know the other will happen. Um, or one is causing the other one, clearly. And regression analysis by itself does not ever give you causation. So I can't speak often enough how important it is to not talk about causation when you have a, you know, a, a linear regression that you, you have a really good best fitting curve with a strong correlation does not give you causation. Then finally, we'll get into a hypothesis test. And um, this letter here, it's a Greek letter and that's just part of statistics. We do a lot of Greek letters. Um, it turns out it's the Greek letter for R. I know it looks like a P, but it's the Greek letter for R. And remember, R was the correlation. And if you have the population correlation, we're going to use the Greek letter rho, which is, again, the Greek letter for R is rho. And that is the plan for today. I want to remind you a few things. One is um, your project is due a week from Sunday. So don't wait till the last minute. Um, you should be strongly working on it now. You should have a good plan. You should have posted your plan on the uh, Project One discussion board so that I can help you out with that and let you know. Because um, almost all of them, when someone posts, you know, usually they're pretty good, but there's always a few things that can be adjusted and made better. So um, at this point, hopefully you've done that already. Then you can collect your data. Remember, it does not have to be a survey of people. It could just be collecting little, literally data, pairs of things from two different things, okay, or gr two groups. And doesn't have to be people. can be lots of different things. But you should have your null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis set up at which you're talking about a population mean for the null hypothesis and you know, for one population mean is equal to the other population mean. So it's real important that 
imagining the data you're going to collect, it should be numbers, not a bunch of, yes, it happened, but actually numbers for each of the two things. Okay, so that's really important. It's a mistake I've seen a few people do, and you don't want to make that mistake. You want to make sure that you have quantitative variables. Um, so that's the, the main thing. And again, I'm, I check the discussion board often. So post any question you have on the project to discussion board, and I'll be um, happy to answer probably pretty quick. There may be one day this week, there could be 20, and uh, this weekend for 24 hours, or I may not be around because I might be backpacking. But um, other than one day over the weekend, might be Saturday, um, you know, I'll, I'll get back to you really fast. I promise. Um, I mean, it won't be every moment because I do sleep and eat and all that kind of stuff, but I'll, I'll definitely get back to you. So, um, so the project, again, you should already have your idea. Hopefully you posted it and, um, and I'm here to help out. Okay. There's also the tutors that can help too. Um, and my office hours, you're welcome to come in um, on Zoom and, you know, pop in just where you are right now if you're in Zoom. And if you're not watching this YouTube, the Zoom link is in the syllabus. Okay, so that is the plan. Are there any questions about anything? Any questions? Okay, I'm not seeing y'all jump in with questions. But I just want to remind you, if you have questions that come up and you haven't thought about them now, um, feel free to pop them in the um, in the chat box, and I'll be happy to answer or just ask um, vocally if you want, and I'll be happy to answer. Okay, so if there aren't any questions, um, let's jump to regression analysis. So as I mentioned, um, what we're doing, and this is, uh, I should, I guess I should mention one more thing about the calendar. Um, because next Monday is a holiday, I'm not really allowed to do a webinar on Monday. So instead of, you know, we usually do every other week, Monday and then Tuesday. Um, next week will have to be Tuesday at lunchtime um, because Monday evening doesn't, I'm not supposed to do that. So I try not to, I try to give you the holiday. Um, so just let you know that uh, next week, Monday is off. Um, I'll still be checking my email, but I'll pretend, but I won't like admit it to everyone because I'm not supposed to work. But um, but, you know, feel free to ask. But again, our webinar next week will be Tuesday at noon. And that is the plan. And that'll be the last webinar, by the way. And then uh, one more note is that um, two weeks from tomorrow, so two weeks from tomorrow is the last really day of class. So that's your last chance to do the final exam. And then the class is basically over. Okay, I mean, I'll grade it the next day and stuff, but just let you know that that's um, in terms of schedule, we're getting close to the end. All right, so let's talk a little about scatter plots and R and R squared and all that kind of stuff. So I think I want to do a scatter plot and I want to show you, I think I can do that. Um, if we go to the calculator and you'll see we're really close to the end. So what number calculator do you think this week is going to be all about? The hint is really close to the end, but not the end. Yeah, 24, because this week is all about regression analysis. Everything we do um, for this week, we'll use the regression analysis calculator. So um, this week, there is just one calculator. Next week, there's only one also, different one. Okay, so what this will do is it'll create a scatter plot. I'm just going to make up some numbers and just show you what they look like. So let's say that let's say you did a survey and you asked, I don't know, maybe how many days a week do you exercise as a first? And then how many days a week um, do you go to a restaurant to eat? And let's suppose the first person said they exercise three days a week, but they only go to the re restaurant once a week. So that'd be three and a one. And notice it's quantitative, they're numbers. So the X is a three, the Y is a one. If I hit plot points, then it'll plot that point. So far, so good. You'll notice we have this point at three comma one. Okay. Then what I can do is I can go to another point. Let's say another person said, ah, oh, you know, I don't go to the gym. 
I never exercise and I'm a zero and, but I eat out seven days a week. So zero comma seven, I hit five points. And now we have two points. Okay. So these points are now plotted. Okay. And we can kind of see that this works out. Any questions so far? Okay. The other thing is you'll notice that for any two points, there's always a line that goes through them, right? Okay, that's just true for points, right? Every two points has a line through them, any two distinct points. Okay, let's say the next person that you, you surveyed said, you know, I exercise four days a week and I eat out two days a week. So I plot four, two. Now all of a sudden we have three points. Okay, and you'll notice a few things. One is we have three points. These points plotted on this graph uh, is called the scatter plot. Any questions on what a scatter plot is? So again, it, it plots the points from the, the from the survey. Okay. You'll also notice that these three points, they don't lie on a line. You could try connecting two points to a line, but then you won't hit the third point, any of these two points. And that's that's pretty typical when you have more than two points and you're doing any kind of survey, is you don't have a perfect line. Let's say we asked another person, and let's suppose that um, that other person had the data point four times a week um, they exercise, and they also eat out four times a week. So four comma four. Okay, and we can plot those four, we, the, this next point, and now we have more to our scatter plot. You'll notice there's also a line that has plotted. Uh, the mathematics behind how to actually get this line is too deep for this class. So this is one of those, you're gonna have to trust me. But what it does, it kind of is your best fitting line to the points. What it does is if you look at say this point on the left, and if you go below it and you see how far you have to walk down to get to that line, and you square that number it turns out and do that for the next one, how far you have to walk up in this case, and then the next one and the next one, and you add up all those squares, it actually, this line minimizes how that kind of sum of squares, basically it makes sure that the points are as close as you can get to that line, okay? The details mathematically are too difficult, but hopefully you get the idea that this point is, sometimes they call it the best fitting line. Any questions? Any questions on this particular example of what a scatter plot is and what it means to kind of draw a line that fits the points as good as possible? Okay. Some of the things that you want to do statistically, I'll get into more details in a bit. One is you say, well, are these points? pretty close to the line, or are these points just all over the place, okay? And if you look at this, these are, it might be, you know, you notice as you go to the right, it goes downwards a bit, um, but it's not a great fit. Um, there's a measurement of how good that fit is. And one of that measurements is, is R, okay? R is the first letter of regression, but people usually call it the correlation. Okay, so that's kind of a measurement of how good a fit a line is. Okay, if the dots are all over the place, you're gonna have a real a R that's really close to zero. If the dots are very close to being on a line, then you're gonna have an R that is it's far from zero, it's either close to one or close to negative one. If they're close to being on a positively slope line, you'll be on a R close to one. And if you're close to being on a negatively slope line, R will be close to negative one, okay? Whereas you could be in the middle, you could say 0.5 and then you 
you know, you're you're not that close, but you're not that far, kind of thing. Any questions on that idea? Any questions on the picture and kind of picturing this out? Okay. And you'll notice, by the way, there's a whole lot of stuff that this does. It actually gives the R. So this R is negative 0.765 or so. You'll notice that the slope of this line is negative, right? If you go from right left to right, it's going downwards. So when you have a negatively sloped line, R will always be negative. When you have a positively sloped line, R will always be positive. Okay, so this will do it. By the way, it also will give you the equation of the line. We'll get into that when it's more useful, when we have real data, instead of just stuff I made up like this example. And you'll notice Y equals a number, and then in this case, minus 1.0698X. Okay, so that's how lines are. There's a slope, which is a number in front of the X. And then there's a Y intercept, which is a number that doesn't have an X next to it. Okay, we'll get into the details in a little bit. Any questions on that? I'll get into the hypothesis test later. Any questions? Anyone lost? Are you following? Everyone good? Okay, let's go back. And let me get kind of like formally what R is, because R is really important. So again, R is called the correlation. And you've probably heard that word before. You know, this thing is correlated to that. Um, that's a word that a lot of people use. So R is called the correlation. So R is a measurement, how correlated it is. And is it correlated in a positive or negative way, right? Does it go up or down when the first one goes up? And that's kind of what that R is. Okay, R is always a number between negative one and one. So if you think R is four, you're wrong. If you ever do data and you get like 4.74, it means you're reading it wrong. That's not what R is, okay? It means you made a mistake. Often it means if you read far to your right, you'll see like an E to the negative eight or something. And that means you, there's an, uh, a scientific notation where you got to move the decimal place eight to the left and you get a bunch of zeros before it. Uh, and that can happen, so be careful, okay? Uh, the sign of R is the same as the sign of the slope of that regression line. If R is close to negative one, the points are close to a negatively slope line. Can you think of an example where you have two quantitative variables at which R is going to be close to negative one? Let's see if you can think of one. Maybe you can post it in the chat box. Can you think of an example where you're going to have a correlation close to negative one? And there are lots of examples, by the way. Let's see if you can pop in the chat box an idea Correlation close to negative one. Yeah, and hopefully you're all typing. might be an example. So that would be two variables. Okay. Heating water and volume remaining. Okay. That's a good one. That's a good one. So you start out with a, you know, maybe a liter of water in a pan. And then in this case, when you say heating water, there's actually a couple things that you could mean. You might mean the, um, uh, the temperature, the temperature. So you stick it in the oven and you turn the temperature. If you turn the temperature up, and then you wait, yeah, increasing temperature. And then maybe you wait 10 minutes. You wanna see how much volume is remaining, okay? If you heat it up to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 
there'll be less water remaining than if you heat it up to say 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And that, that's a great example. And R will be close to one. It won't be exactly equal to one, it turns out. Um, I'm not going to get into the, the chemistry on that, but you probably all know that if you turn the if you turn the heat way up and you wait a while, the water boils out. Okay. Any questions on that? That's a really nice example. Okay. If R is close to positive one, then the points are close to all being on a positively sloped line. Can you think of a um, of an example? Again, two different variables, just like the negative one, where you're going to have an R close to positive one. And there's lots of those things. There's even more of them. See if you come up with a good example. Maybe you can all pop it in. Okay, weight gain and food intake, okay? Okay, weight gain and food intake. In fact, I'd even go a little bit further than that. I would say weight gain and calories intake. Okay, I eat a lot of salad. <laughs> I don't, honestly, I don't gain weight when I eat salad. I love salad. <laughs> so I would say weight gain and calorie intake might be a better one. Does that make sense? Yeah, so definitely if you, if you gain more weight, there's a, there's a higher chance that you've been eating a lot of calories or consuming a lot of calories, okay? And that would be an example where R would be close to one. It wouldn't be exactly one, okay? Um, for example, I actually take a lot of food in too, and uh, I'm a lot thinner than people my age and my peers. Um, I just have a really high metabolism. So that could happen, and often there are other things that that go with it. Okay, if R is close to zero, then there's no line that fits the point well. Can you think of a, an example where R is going to be close to zero? That would be two, two variables where R is close to zero. Let's think, think of an example on that. And there's lots and lots of them. Yep, yeah, yeah, R equals zero means they're not correlated and close to zero means there's almost no correlation is what you would say. And can you think of an example? There's lots and lots of them. You just have to get creative. Most any two things you would guess probably if you randomly guessed. Any thoughts? Okay, running a marathon and increasing. Okay, so again, you get have a variable. So do you mean when you say running a marathon, maybe you can say something like the time it takes a marathon runner to finish the marathon and what their income is. Maybe that's what you mean. Because running a marathon is not enough detail to make it quantitative. Did you run a marathon is a yes, no question. But how long did it take you to finish that marathon, to complete the marathon? That would be the quantitative variable. And it's really important that they're quantitative. Yeah, so possibly, and by the way, these might be correlated. I actually never done the research on it. I have no idea if faster people are, you know, richer or poorer. I don't know. There, there, may, there may be, there may be a correlation. There may be a correlation. One thing, I, one, one example I like to give um, because it makes it really obvious, I think everyone would agree, is the, the temperature, the high temperature in Tahoe and the number of the total score of the soccer team that played in Sydney, Australia on that day. Because 
I could tell you there is no correlation between how warm it is in Tahoe and how many how many goals a soccer team in Sydney, Australia is going to make. Do you agree? Okay, that should that I if, if that had a correlation, I would be in shock because there should be nothing about nothing to do with each other. Um, in terms of the scatter plot, okay, if if you have a R that's close to zero, then most of the time the scatter plot is going to look like the night sky. Okay. And by the way, sorry if you're in LA, um, that doesn't work because the night sky doesn't have any stars. <laughs> if you have too much light pollution. But if you're in Tahoe, our night sky has beautiful stars all the way through the, through the sky. And there's no clear line that it even gets close to fitting in terms of all the stars in the sky and at night on a beautiful night. Okay, so typically a scatter plot is just going to be points all over the place. Okay, any questions at all on what R is all about? Okay, and often you want to see if there's a correlation. Okay. Um, an example of a positive correlation where they where it meant a lot is they looked at, and this was, you know, around when I was born, like many, many, many years ago, is they looked at how many cigarettes people smoke today and how long they lived. Okay. And they found any guess on what the correlation might have been? between the number of cigarettes people smoke a day and how long they live? It wouldn't be exactly negative one. See, exactly negative one means that you can tell, that you know exactly how long someone's gonna live based on how many cigarettes they smoke. Does that make sense? So if it's exactly negative one, it's a perfect fit. Yeah, it'd be more like negative 0.9. Because if you smoke a lot of cigarettes, it doesn't mean you will die very soon, but you have a higher probability of dying soon than if you don't smoke a lot of cigarettes. Any questions on that? So it'd be more like negative point, 0 0.9. Okay. And by the way, what happened is when they found that correlation was negative 0 0.9, then they said, hey, maybe we need to do some research, find out what's going on. and they then they then they brought the biologists in. Okay, statistics is not enough to know that cigarettes caused the deaths, but it is good enough to say, hey, let's look into it further. So then they brought the scientists in, the biologists, and they found out that the cigarette smoke was doing all kinds of bad things biologically to the lungs and the liver and just cancer and all kinds of terrible things. And then they could advertise how terrible smoking cigarettes are. Any questions on that idea? Okay, so that was a biggie. You know, the correlation is used a lot. And that was, you know, one of the most important ones, you know, in, in terms of the last hundred years or so. Okay, we're going to have another one too that's important to Tahoe. Uh -huh. Okay, then comes R squared. All right, so just note R squared is a square bar. So for example, if R was negative 0.9, then R squared would be positive 0.81. Nine squared is 81, right? Okay, so R squared is just a square of R, but it's actually a lot deeper than just that. Okay, first thing is when you have R squared, it's easier to understand it if you turn it into a percent. So if you got 0.81, it's easier to say 81%. And trust me on that, when I get to the next point, you'll see why. So then what, what it tells you is that if you ignore, if you ignore X completely, so let's look at the cigarette and lifespan thing. Um, lifespan has pretty strong, pretty big, pretty darn big standard deviation. Do you agree? Okay. You could die when you're a baby. You can die when you're 98 years old, you know. 
who knows how long you're going to live, and it's all over the place. Do you agree? Very big spread of data. Okay. Now it turns out that if if you only look at the people who all smoke the same number of cigarettes per day, then that lifespan that that kind of variation in how long those people live is going to get decreased. Okay. And if let's say R squared was say 0.7, the, then it would be decreasing by 70%. So that variation could decrease a lot if R squared is say 70%. So kind of in detail, if the variation or the standard deviation in Y variable if considered large, but if you look just at the Y values that have all X values that are almost the same, then the variation is reduced by on average, the R squared percent. Anyone lost on what I just said? Okay, so if you have, if you have a very small R squared, then it's not very useful to know what the X value is to predict the Y value. If you have a very large R squared, it's very useful. Because remember that how good a prediction you have completely depends on the standard deviation, right? Because if standard deviation is really, really large, good luck trying to figure out what your best guess is for a random value of X, because it could be all the way up and down. But if your standard deviation is really small, then your value of X randomly is likely to be in a very small range. Any questions on that idea? So knowing R gives you a really good predict, uh, knowing, knowing X gives you a really pre good prediction of Y if R squared is large. Because your standard deviation is decreased by that R squared percent. Any questions? I will let you know that's usually the hardest part of this whole chapter, is to fully understand what I just said. And write it out, by the way. And, um, oh, I should mention, um, this is week 10. What's important about the number 10? Yeah, it's an even week. Even weeks have exams, okay? So week 10, we'll have an exam. Um, so there is an exam. Don't forget, by the end of this week, you have to take the exam, the week 10 exam. And you're going to have to interpret R squared, okay, and interpret all these other things, too, that I'm talking about. So please stop and ask questions if you have any questions about it, because you're going to have to interpret it. And, you know, I'm going to grade your interpretation. Okay, and that has to be done by Sunday. I'd recommend not waiting till the very last minute, but definitely practice before you take it. I do the assignment, the chapter 12 assignment before you take the exam. Don't do it in the other order. That would just be silly. Okay, so this is a week 10. So you have to know how to kind of write these down and I'll go over those in a bit. Okay, so right now I'm kind of going the ideas of things. Okay, so we have the regression line. If you remember, you have this line. And a line always has a slope and a y-intercept. Hopefully, you um, you remember that from um, kind of basic math, right? Lines have a slope and a y-intercept. Hopefully, you remember um, when you learned the slope at the beginning, when you were maybe in seventh grade or something. Um, what did, how did you learn the slope? There were three words that your teacher probably used to say what the slope is. Do you remember what those three words were? Here's a hint, two of them start with an R. The first and the third one start with an R. To interpret the slope or to say, what, how do you find the slope or what is the slope of a line? Do you remember those words? Regression, I doubt in seventh grade, your teacher talked about regression. <laughs> Way too young for that. 
talking about just slope of a regular line, nothing to do about statistics or regression analysis. Remember, it's very important. When I say it, I just say, of course, if you don't type it in now. Okay, I don't see you jumping in, so let me remind you. So the slope of the line is the rise over run. Does that ring a bell? I can't imagine any teacher not using those words, rise over run. Okay, and you got that when you're in middle school or so. So that was a slope of a line, is a rise of a run. Now the rise, okay, yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a long time for me, by the way, too, but, but I still remember it. <laughs> when I still remember being taught that a long, long time ago. Okay, so the rise is how much Y has changed. Okay, so if you remember, it was Y2 minus Y1, and sometimes they say. And the run is how much X changes. Okay, so it's how much Y changes divided by how much X changes. Sometimes it's easiest to just say X changed by one, and then how much will Y change? So we can say that if X is increased by one unit, then Y is predicted or tends to increase by the slope number of units. So if the slope is say 0.6, then Y is predicted to increase by 0.6 units if X increases by one unit. That ring a bell at all doing that stuff? Okay, again, that's review of algebra more than it is statistics, but we're gonna be using it a lot. Okay, and the y-intercept, that was a value of y when x is equal to zero. That was a y-intercept. It's where it crosses the y-axis. And if you're on the y-axis, x is zero because that's the definition of the y-axis. Okay, and in fact, if we look, we can see the y-axis is right here. So that's the value at which x is zero. And right here, kind of on that crossing between the line and the y-axis, that is the y-intercept. So if x is zero, okay, sometimes it's meaningless. So for example, if we looked at, um, let's say, let's say you wanted to do a regression analysis. The first question is, how much do you weigh? And the second question is, how old are you? Why would the y-intercept have no meaning at all? Okay, if those were the, if the x was how much do you weigh and y is how old are you? So you're looking at that comparison. And for children, you would guess that, you know, as people get older, as, as people weigh more, they're more likely to be older if you're looking to say elementary school. So why would the x, why would the x intercept have no meaning, uh, the y intercept have no meaning? Any thoughts? And it's very important to be able to analyze things like that. No, does it have meaning or not, and why? Let's see jumping in. Okay, if X is zero, X is how much you weigh. How many people weigh zero pounds? Yeah, you can't weigh zero pounds. You're not a person if you weigh zero pounds. Do you agree? <laughs> Maybe you're a ghost, but you're not a person. Is that clear? So why? So the y-intercept in that case would have no meaning because you can't weigh zero pounds. It just can't happen. Okay, so there are different times when you have no meaning. One is when that value has no meaning. It also could happen that um, the value of y for the y-intercept could have no meaning. That that could have, that can happen. The x equals zero is more often, but the y sometimes might be negative. And it might be something where you can't be negative, like something like, you know, how much time did it take you to um, brush your teeth? And if you're wide, you know, based on, I don't know, um, 
how much you ate that day. And if the wine intercept was negative one, then that can't happen because you can't take negative one minutes to brush your teeth, that kind of thing. So sometimes that happens. So why might have no relevance also. The other thing that can happen, by the way, is that if none of the data values are anywhere close to x equals zero, then you also don't give meaning to the y intercept. Okay, otherwise it does have meaning. Okay, and again, it's your best, if it does have meaning, it's the best prediction for y when x is equal to zero. Any questions on that idea? Okay, so now I'm going to go into what I consider the most important regression analysis that has ever happened in my, where I live, and that's Lake Tahoe. Okay, and if I remember right, neither of you are in Lake, no, no you're not in Lake Tahoe, right? But you, have you been to Tahoe? Have both of you been to Lake Tahoe? Okay, yes, lots. Okay. Okay, so one of the main one of the main things we care about in Lake Tahoe is that our lake is beautiful, blue, and like you can look down and see very deep in the water. It's just gorgeous. Okay. So we want to keep it that way. Okay, yeah, keep Tahoe blue. Absolutely. Okay. By the way, here's my water bottle. <laughs> I drink Tahoe Tap. It's wonderful. <laughs> Our water is really good. So we want to keep Tahoe blue. And this is, this is it's a really cool story. This happened a long time ago. Um, but it was when it, uh, I hadn't been teaching here long at all. And my student actually was there. They had the president of the United States came to Tahoe. Okay, along with um, some senators and um, and a bunch of a bunch of politicians, and the UC Davis scientists, okay, did a presentation on the depth of clarity in Tahoe. So, what the depth of clarity is is they would take a boat, and I don't know if you can see this boat says UC Davis, and they would drop a what's called a seeky dish which is like a plate a white plate and they connect it to a, a rope and they keep letting it getting deeper and deeper until they couldn't see it anymore and they'd measure how long that rope was and that was the definition of the depth of clarity and what they did is they measured that and they had been measuring measuring that since the late 1960s and then in the year 1999, that was the last measurement just before the president had come. And they looked at this data. Now you should be able to see this. And when you look at this, you can see the scatter plot. And they made it kind of pretty by making the, instead of like regular circle dots, they made them look like little, little dishes that they put in the water, but that's the idea. And you can see the scatter plot. And does it look like there is a correlation between the year and the depth of clarity? Or are they all over the place? Could you imagine a line going through and not being that far from the points? What do you think? Yeah, there definitely seems to be correlation. OK, now ready for a trick question? Do you think that correlation is positive or negative? Okay. What you didn't hear is what I had just said. This is a trick question. Okay. Correlation is actually negative because here's the trick. If you look at the y-axis, this is UC Davis, not me, by the way. Um, then you'll notice the y-axis is upside down. Here's 15, then 20 below it, 25 below that, 30 below that, 35 below that. Yeah, so it's a trick question, okay? Um, we'll see it in a bit where it's not a trick question. We can actually see it, okay, where it looks like it should look. Uh, but they want to do that so you can kind of see the boat and look at, like, the picture of what Tahoe would look like and it's how deep it is. So that's why it's all upside down. And they do that, okay? 
it's not to like try to trick the president, but to make it look prettier. So what they did is they used regression analysis. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy these points separated by commas. Okay. And by the way, something I did personally is I took all these dots and I eyeballed the values for the dots. And then I wrote them down with commas so I don't have to type them one at a time. It's a lot faster. I can go back to that. Let me refresh. And instead of do one point at a time, what I created when I programmed this is you can put them all in separated by commas into the X value. And by the way, these numbers, what does the number 68 mean? Just to make sure that we're all on board. What's the number 68? Yeah, in particular, it means 1968. Okay, it would have just been too much typing for me to write down all the 19s because <laughs> they're all 19 somethings. Okay, so it's it's the number of years after the year 1900 is a way of kind of defining this. And it's a lot less typing to write it that way. And, and that works fine, by the way. And then we have the depth of clarity, and this is in meters, by the way. Science usually uses meters, not um, feet or yards. So that's going to be more Y values. And again, I copied and pasted them, and that's what I got. Okay, then I hit plot points. And now it actually, you can actually see that the regression line has a negative slope. The correlation is negative. You can see that from the picture. You can see the scatter plot. Okay, this does not say that it has gone down every year in clarity. Okay, for example, if you look at, say, the year um, 1982, I think that is, and then 1983, 1984, 5, 6, it went up in those like five years there. Do you see that? But you see a trend line of it going down. Does not mean it went down every year. It just means that we have this trend and we call that a correlation. Any questions on this idea? Okay, so we can definitely see there's a correlation. There's no question. Clearly, it's not a correlation of negative one because it's the points aren't all on a line. If it was negative one, the points would be exactly on a line. And in fact, the correlation is about negative 0.91. That's R. Okay, which is, by the way, a pretty strong correlation. Okay, it's a pretty strong correlation. All right. Then we have R squared is about 0.84 rounded. And you should always do rounding rules. That's important, by the way. I do take off points if you were write it 0.83 as your correlation, as your R squared, because that six makes it go up to a 0.84. Okay. And often you'll say R squared is 84% because it's a little easier to interpret. Okay. And then we have the regression equation. Y is equal to about 48.2765 minus 0.2804x. So I think I'm going to copy and paste this stuff. Well, I'll go back and forth, actually. I think that's easier. So the slope. So the slope of this line. What is the slope of the line? Here's the line by the regression equation is the line. What's the slope? Maybe rounded to two decimal places. So what is the slope of our line? It's very important that you can read, read a line and know what the slope is. I don't see all typing it in. Okay, so here's our line. 
y equals 48.2765 plus negative 0.02804x. That's the equation of a line. What is the slope of that line? Right, yeah, the slope of the line is a number that is in front of the x multiplied by x, and that is about negative 0.28 to two decimal places of accuracy. So let's put that in. Okay, sometimes it's easier to write it as a fraction. And the way I like to write as a fraction, there's lots of choices is I can write this as negative 0 0.28 divided by one. Anytime you have a decimal, you can always put that to anything you want over one. That's mathematically always allowed. And then the slope is a rise over a run, so the rise is negative 0 0.28, and the run is one. Any questions on that? Okay, the run is how much the x has changed. Well, the x-axis corresponds to the year. So interpreting the slope is, we can say, for every year that has passed. Because one year, that's your run. On average, the rise is negative 0.28 the rise is the depth of clarity how far how deep you can see down until you can't see anymore so on average the depth of clarity has decreased because a negative slope is a decrease okay has decreased by 0 0.28 meters. Any questions on interpreting the slope of this regression line? Okay, and you're gonna be required to be able to do these kind of things, you know, for different examples, but it's very important that you can do that. Any questions? Okay, the y-intercept, we want to interpret the y-intercept and state why it is or is not useful, okay? So first thing, the y-intercept for our line is what? Maybe round, you can round is fine. What's, yeah, 48.28, probably 48 is good enough. That's two significant digits. So the y-intercept is 48. Okay. Is the y-intercept meaningful? What do you think? Is the y-intercept meaningful? Okay. All right, so the y-intercept means x is zero. Okay, and as I mentioned, there's different reasons why it could or could not be meaningful. Okay, if x equals zero doesn't even make sense, then it's not meaningful. In this case, x equals zero makes sense. That would be the year 1900. Okay, if the y value for the y-intercept, which in this case is 48, can't happen, then it wouldn't be meaningful. But 48, 48 meters in depth, I mean, that would really be seeing a lot, but it might be possible. But here's the bigger problem. If you look at the data that was collected, those values are between, looks like, you know, 68 or so and 99. 
the y-intercept is zero and that's nowhere near any of these data values. And if you're really far from any of the data values, then you don't try to interpret the y-intercept. You just say it's not meaningful because there are no, um, no data values anywhere close to zero. Any questions on that? All right, so now imagine, imagine you're the president of the United States at that time. Okay, see if you remember who was the president of the United States at the time. <laughs> Not a math question. Anyone remember? That was Clinton. Okay, and just note, it was kind of cool. My statistics student at the time sir, was with Clinton, served him his lunch. <laughs> Is that cool? Um, that's just an off, off thing, but kind of cool. But if you were that president, if you were the president of the United States, then let's see if what decisions you might make. Well, one thing is you would say, well, what might it be in the year 2023? That's today, right? How are you going to make a prediction of the late clarity in 2023? How are we going to use this regression analysis to predict the late clarity in 2023? Imagine again, you were, you know, you were there in the year 1999 or 2000. Any thoughts? Okay, what you would do is you would take this regression equation. I'll even copy it, put it into the scientific calculator. Here's the equation, but instead of X, it's times the year 2023 is 123 years after the year uh, uh, 1900. And what the calculator gives us is rather than the nearest whole meter is about 14 meters. So the best prediction would be 14 meters. Any questions on how I did that? Okay, would, by the way, do you think it would be okay if the lake clarity was 14 meters instead of what it is, you know, what it was then at, you know, 25 meters or so? What do you think? Well, this is okay. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, it would not be okay at all. Okay, that would mean that our lake just got black. Okay, our, it would mean that we just don't have a clear lake anymore. And one of the great things about Lake Tahoe is it's clear and beautiful. And all of a sudden it's like scummy and gross and you can hardly see down. Any questions on that idea? Okay, so it turns out um, what the president did is he went to Congress and the Congress too, and they actually passed a bill and they put a lot of money in to make sure that this prediction didn't happen. Okay, by doing everything they could to deal with all the environmental disasters that were happening in Lake Powell at the time. Okay, and I won't get into the details, you know, but if you take one of our environmental science classes at our college and you learn all about the things they did. Sorry, can we stop you? But there are lots of things. Said something wrong. Okay. Yeah. Because any questions on that? Any questions? Yeah. So. Okay. So. Longitudinal. Yeah. Sorry, the background noise. I can't do anything about. If you can't hear me, let me know though. That's the important thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so we want to interpret y r squared. So I want to remind you again. Okay, so r squared is the square of r. And if you look at y values that all have the x values that are almost the same, then the variation in, um, is reduced by r percent on average. So we can turn that into relevance. So let me type in how to interpret R squared. So we can say is that there is a, a large um, variation in depth of clarity. Over the past more than should have many years. Yeah, and I'll take that into account. But so now what we're going to do is we're going to say we're just going to look at values of x that are all close to each other. Okay, remember x is the year. So we're looking at years that are all close to each other. So, but if we look at the depth of clarity, for only years that are all close to each other, then this depth of clarity tends to go down, uh, sorry, the, this uh, variation of the depth of clarity, tends to go down on average by, and R squared was about 0.84, so by 84%. Okay, another way of thinking about this is there are a lot, there, there could be a lot of different reasons why the depth of clarity changes. Okay. And we can say that the year you're looking at is kind of 84% of that kind of reasoning. Not causation, but prediction. What are some of the other reasons why the clarity of Lake Tahoe might be higher or lower in any particular year. And again, I know you're not from Tahoe, but any thoughts? Here's a hint. The depth of clarity in 2023 is probably going to be pretty terrible. It's going to be pretty low. That might give you an idea. And not because 2023 is way past 2020. For a different reason. Anyone know what the reason might be why the depth of clarity for Lake Tahoe this year is probably going to be bad? Yeah, yeah, we had a huge amount, huge, huge amount of precipitation this year. Okay, in fact, the most since 1952. And it turns out that besides just, you know, how long it had been since, you know, civilization, you know, hopped in and, you know, messed with our lake. Um, the other things that happen is uh, the big E is weather. Okay, so that's why you're not going to get an exact perfect correlation because there's other things that are going to be affecting the Y value, in this case, the depth of clarity. And one of those things is how much precip you had that year, snow melt, rain. Uh, it's also been raining a lot, including, uh, I think it's 60% chance today. So this year, again, that we're going to have a big change to the depth of clarity probably because of weather, not because it's a year after last year. Any questions on that? Okay, so very, very important. Okay, and again, if you lived in Tahoe, you would know that that is the most important statistical analysis that ever happened here. One of the cool things that I think is really neat is I talked to the scientists who did this, this research and collect this data. 
And, uh, you know, I wanted to get some information because I'm curious. I live here. I'm a statistician, so I care about it. And I asked him, you know, in terms of each year they take a sample, but if you take just a sample on one particular day, how do you know that's reliable? And I said, do you take more than one sample? Do you, do you go out more than one day a year? They said, yes. Any guess, and the hope is you might, and the hint is this made me smile a lot when they told me. Any guess on how many days a year they told me they went out and did the measurements? The hint is it made me smile. Three and six, five, no, no. That'd be way too hard. It'd be too dangerous because there are days when it's so snowy and miserable that it's not even safe to be on a boat. <laughs> Okay, and it turns out if it's really sunny, you can't go out because you don't get any depth of clarity because all you get is a big reflection off the water and you can't see anything. <laughs> they have to do it. They have to do with this thousand in the near. Today would work actually. <laughs> Can you guess? I told you it would make you smile, and you should all understand the reason once you see it. Okay, so I'm going to tell you, thirty-one days a year is what he told me. Why did that make me smile? Very important for your project, by the way. One and two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you if you do a collection of 31 days and take an average of the depth of clarity for those days during that year, then you can say that we have a normal distribution. And then you can do all the statistics you want to do in regression analysis, it turns out. Um, it's too complicated for me to do the details, but I can tell you that number 31 is still important, is you need a large sample size. And in this case, over at least 31 per, you know, per year is what they needed to do to have a full statistical analysis. All right, so let me give you the templates on how regression analysis works. Okay, first thing is well, for R squared, the Y variable has a standard deviation to be, that can be quite large. Okay, if we only focus on Y values that correspond to a fixed value of X, then the standard deviation or the variation is decreased. Let me write on average. by your R squared as a percent times 100%. Okay, so again, that's a template that will help you when you're trying to interpret R squared because that's usually the hardest part of this whole chapter is this interpretation. It's a little bit, um, it's a lot of language, put it that way. Any questions on R squared? Okay, so one of the main things about any kind of regression analysis is if all you have is data and statistics, you can never, ever, ever imply causation, okay? If you want to deal with causation, for example, the smoking example where you looked at how many cigarettes people smoke versus how long they live on, you know, on average, then you need a team, okay? And that team, part of the team will be statisticians. But what will the other part of the team be if you want to show causation? So the statisticians should show correlation. We're really good at showing correlation. But if you want to show causation, who else do you need in the team? Don't see all jumping in. If you don't, then I'll tell you. Scientists. <laughs> so then you need to actually study the science of it and see what's going on. Okay. So for example, it wasn't the year, the, the one year passing that was causing our lake to go bad. What it was, was just a lot of houses and streets and all that kind of stuff messing with the water flow into the lake 
And we got scientists in there to do measurements of all the stuff that was flowing into Lake Tahoe. And in particular places where there were people and places where not people, for example, and where there were a lot of people, then there was a lot more mess flowing in that would cause the depth to go down. Okay. The, the statistics is not what showed causation. It showed correlation. What showed causation was the science. Any questions on that? Okay, the only way really to show causation, which is very difficult to do with statistics, is a randomized control study. Okay, but often you just can't do that. And with year, you can never do that. You can't, you can't like blindly make a year happen. <laughs> okay, now we're going to make it be 1942. You can't do that. <laughs> so that would be an example where it would be impossible to do a randomized control study. Okay. There are times when you can do it, especially with animals. With people, there's often ethical issues. But if you want to, like, you know, force animals to, like, breathe in cigarette smoke, you can give them a whole lot of cigarette smoke daily and, and you know, randomize different levels of cigarette smoke for a bunch of different animals, maybe 31 animals for each, for each kind of test group. And then that will give you causation because it's a randomized control study. Okay, but if it's not a randomized control study, you can never use causation. And some of the words that you should never use when all you have is, is regression analysis is cause. Okay, don't use, you know, hey, we found, we found R was 0.99, so therefore this causes that. Okay, and by the way, something, you may not have even noticed this before, but if you look at the word because, what word do you see inside that word because? Yeah, cause. So again, dangerous, don't use the word because. Because that word because has a word because in it. <laughs> okay, so avoid those words. Another one, and this is more of a string of words, is don't do an if, blah, 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 then this will happen or then it will. Um, because that is a... English long way of saying cause. Okay, the, the if, then it will is a cause. Any questions on that? It doesn't mean that it doesn't cause it. It just means that you don't know if it's a causation. So you that's why you use correlated. There is a correlation between, which is not the same thing as a causation. Any questions? Okay, then the last thing we want to do, okay, and in order, sometimes you do this towards the beginning, but it's just the last thing I'm doing today, is we do a hypothesis test. And you want to find out, is there a correlation? Okay, is there a correlation? And that's, by the way, in our class, we're going to stick with, is there a correlation? Okay, when you get more advanced, you can talk about, is the correlation positive, or is the correlation negative, or is it at least this? But for our class, is it? Just is there a correlation? And I will let you know that this H0 and H1 will never change in our class for chapter 12. H0 is rho equals zero. Rho is a population correlation. Remember, R was the sample correlation. Rho is a population correlation. So H0 is rho equals zero. That means there is no correlation. Because if, if the correlation is zero, there's no correlation. H1 is rho is not equal to zero. And that means there is a correlation. Because if, if the correlation is non-zero, there's a correlation. Might be negative, might be positive, but there's a correlation. Um, I want to let you know that I'm not picky on formality. So if you don't want to use the letter rho because... Maybe you don't remember how to get that Greek letter using your, um, you know, Canvas answer stuff. Then you're welcome to do this and make it, it won't look quite as pretty, but it's good enough for me. I'll let you know the way you spell row is R-H-O in English. So you can write H 
And I usually write an O because it looks better, it looks smaller, and then colon, and then RHO equals zero, and then H1 colon RHO, and then I usually write NOT equals zero. Okay, so if you don't want to have to deal with the um, equation editor and do fancy symbols, then you're welcome to do it this way. Um, I will let you know one of the hardest challenge. If you want to put all of this in one shot into the um, the equation editor in um, Canvas, do you know what the do you know what the biggest challenge is if you're doing it in Canvas, like so for your um, discussion post assignment? Any guess on what the hardest piece would be in the equation editor? Don't see jumping in. It turns out the colon. <laughs> that colon is a pain in the rear for equation editors. <laughs> so sometimes it's just easier to do this and write it in kind of letters like that. RHO equals zero. Don't use full long sentences. I do want you to have symbols or at least implied symbols. Any questions so far? All right, then we can go back to our regression analysis calculator. And when you do that, um, I click, click, which is default to have the R row not equal zero. You get the test statistic of about 12.38. And the p-value is the p-value about 2.56? What do you think? Yeah, good, it's not possible. So what did I not look at? Okay, it's not possible and it's not correct, by the way. Where, where did my eyes not run off to where I should have looked? Don't see you all jumping in. So let me remind you right over here, E negative one, three. Yeah, that means a scientific notation. That means we need to move the decimal 13 places to the left. So instead of 2.56, I can write 0 0.00000000256. It is as close to zero as you can imagine. Any questions at all on getting the p-value? Okay. I want to remind you that a lot of people have been trouble with this in the discussion board. If the p-value is less than 0 0.01, then we can say that we have strong statistically significant evidence. If it's less than 0 0.001, then you can, you can go extremely strong. If it was, say, 0 0.03, don't use the word strong then you just say statistically significant evidence. If it was, let's say, point, say 0 0.06, then you would say there's weak evidence. And then if it was, say, 0.18, you would say there's no evidence. So we talked about that earlier as an earlier different uh, some weeks ago, but that, that is important to remember. So strong is when you have a really tiny p-value like this. So there is very strong statistically significant evidence to conclude that the, or that there is a correlation between the year and the depth of clarity. in Lake Tahoe. Any questions at all on this example? Okay, and I wanna let you know, um, one is 
That does not mean there's a strong correlation. It means that we have strong evidence there is a correlation. Sometimes you get a strong correlation because you have a very large data set. And maybe the correlation wasn't even that big, but it's not zero. And since your data set is so large, you can always have either strong evidence or clearly no evidence. Okay, when you have a very large um, data set. Any questions on this? Okay, so just a note, this was the prediction. Let me go to it. And that was 14 meters. That was our best prediction. Does that mean the depth of clarity is 14 meters now? If that was our best prediction. Okay, the answer is no. The answer is no. So I wanna remind you, this is the data we have here, okay? So this is assuming that there's no big changes going on, that we're still gonna be in that same society where we're just destroying our lake. But remember what I told you what happened after the president left our town and was had watched the UC Davis group show, show him the statistics? And by the way, um, the president at the time, he actually understood statistics. Uh, um, to me, that's really important. Every president should at least understand statistics so that they can be able to like analyze data and, and be able to understand what people are talking about instead of just some spooky way of talking about stuff. You can actually understand a little bit of science and statistics, which is a good thing. So what happened? They passed this big bill and they put in like $100 million to fix the problem. So yeah, this was the data then, but if you change things, then this prediction won't work, which is good. We don't want to have terrible depth of clarity, right? So do you want to see, you want to see what happened afterwards? Here's all the way up to the year 2020. And if you look at between the year 2000 and the year 2020, what do you notice on this kind of right side of this figure between 2000 and 2020? What do you notice about these dots? If you ignore everything to the left and we're just looking at you know, past when the bell was passed, what do you see? Yeah, now there's no correlation at all. Zero slope. Just ups and downs, not just going up as time goes or going down as time goes. It's just up and down a little bit. Has a lot to do with weather, actually. <laughs> Mostly weather. Okay. Um, so in particular, so notice like over here, the clarity got better. We had a drought. <laughs> Droughts are good for clarity, by the way. Um, so that happens. So anyhow, uh, and there's other things that could happen too. but. So you have to be careful about just saying that we know what the future is going to be because the hope is that after doing statistics, you can learn how to make things better so the future isn't a disaster. And hopefully that's how we use statistics in our world is to do better things, okay? And how we can use regression analysis because we can say, look at this. If we just keep going as we are, we're going to have a terrible, disastrous late clarity. So let's fix it. And that's what we did. Okay. And the hope is we don't go back to how we used to be. And we keep with the keep Tahoe blue, as you mentioned a little while ago. Any questions at all on this example? Okay. I'm going to do this one really quick. I'm not going to do the full analysis, but I want to look at it just so you know. So the data below show the results of a study of nine community colleges done that looks at the percentage of students at the community college who receive financial aid and the percent who are business majors, okay? Conduct a hypothesis test for the correlation and perform the full regression analysis. So here we have financial aid and here's our values and I can just copy and paste them in. So let's, um, I'm gonna refresh. 
And then I can copy and paste the X values and the Y values. If they're not separated by commas, you got to put the commas in, by the way. But I wanted to make it easy for us. And I just hit plot points. And there we have it. So we have a full regression analysis. You'll notice that we have a negative correlation. We have a small p-value, not as small as before, but it's still strong evidence to show that we have a correlation. By the way, if you have a p-value that was, say, 0.3, then you guys basically give up. If you have a very large p-value, then you always just say, well, don't even use the regression line. Um, it is always top set of data x. Yeah. And that's just the way I wrote it. I made the program. X is the top. And it says Y is the bottom. And that's just standard. So you usually call that the, the first set of data points, the independent variable, and the second set of data points, the dependent variable. I don't know if you've heard those words before, but sometimes you'll hear those words for the two variables. And often you'll call them X and Y. So hopefully that answers you, your question. Okay, so we definitely have a correlation because our hypothesis test is clear. There's strong statistically significant evidence that there is a correlation between <clears throat> the uh, percentage of community colleges that receive financial aid and the percent who are business majors, okay? Any questions on that? It turns out if you're looking at R and R squared and the p-value, it doesn't matter if you switch the X and Y, you get the same out values, but your slope and Y-intercept will change. That's the big change. Our slope is about negative 0.5. Um, yeah, I'm using a standard level of significance of 0.05, but it really doesn't matter here because P is 0 0.0005. <laughs> which is smaller than any level of significance any, any rational person would ever make. Does that make sense? Okay. So again, you, you kind of decide based on what your study is, what you're going to use your p-value. Usually it's all or nothing. Usually your p-value is going to be really low or really high. That's typical. You're not going to usually be real close to 0.05. Yeah, for... 0.05 is a standard. So if it doesn't tell you, then just use 0.05. But if it does tell you, use whatever it tells you. <laughs> if it says use a p-value, uh, I mean, a, a level of significance of 0.01, then that's what you have to use. Okay. So now we know the slope again was about point, negative 0.5. So that means... For every increase in the percent of students at the community college who receive financial aid, on average, we predict that the percent um, who are business majors decreases by a half a percent. Does that mean that if we give financial, more financial aid for our students, we're going to have fewer business majors? Does it mean that? So does it mean that if we we give more financial aid for our students, maybe by the governor or some you know person who donates a whole lot of money to the college, then we're going to have few then we're going to have fewer business majors at our college. What do you think? Does it mean that? Remember, we had that negative correlation. It's very clear. So does it mean that? Okay, the answer is absolutely no. That would be causation. Right? If we do this, then we will do end up with that. That's causation. What we can say is that if we look at colleges that have less financial aid, then on average, they tend to have fewer business majors. Do you hear the wording is different? 
So you cannot use wording that has anything to do with causation. Any questions on that? Okay, sometimes it's they're both caused by something else. Okay, you never know. Okay, um, I think I'm gonna, I'm not gonna go through all of this. I just wanted to give you another quick example because we spent a lot of time on one example and it's already 1.30 and that's about when I try to finish unless there's some kind of project stuff that I have to go over. Um, but I do wanna remind you, don't forget, don't wait till the last minute to do your projects. You still have some time, but you know the hope is, you know, maybe a week from today or a week from tomorrow or so, you have your draft writ written and emailed to me. Okay, that's that's what I would set for your timeline. Okay, um, so I think I'm going to show you the secret word, which is the word you can't use when you are writing down and interpreting regression, and that is cause. So the secret word of this week is cause, because it's the word you should avoid, except of course, for the secret word, you're, you have to put that in. <laughs> so that is the secret word of the day is cause. Okay, so I think I am going to stop the recording and then I'm going to stop the share also. Let's do that.